I'm going to read his biography. So I first met Adam when we did the show Up and Under together um, two years ago now, three years, uh, two, three years ago now with um, Fingersmith. Hi, Jen. Hi, Pickles. Um, Fingersmith Theatre Company. Um, so it was an integrated show, um, integrated with BSL and English speaking language. Um, and um, Adam's been an actor for a number of years. He produces his own films, um, Vanishing, Retreat. Um, he's, um, I don't know if he's produced or, or starred in this, but he, he's, he, he's been involved with Yorkshire for Deaf Go to Blackpool, Deaf Victorians, Deaf Funny. Um, he's done, uh, he's worked with a lot with Definitely Theatre, um, done their Love's Labour's Lost, Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, he's oh, he was the winner in 2013 at the Deaf Fest Visual Vernacular Competition. That's interesting because we've got a little bit of visual vernacular coming up. And if you don't know what that is, you're gonna be amazed. Okay, it's a beautiful, beautiful style of. Is it a language? It's a, a physical language. Okay. Um, what else has he done? He's a massive rugby fan, so you know, big up the rugby league boys. Um, a proper man sport, I'll tell the. Oh, and he recently did um again with Definitely Theatre. He worked on Sarah Kane's four point four eight Psychosis, which got rave reviews around the country. Um, okay, so without further ado, here is my mate Adam explaining what he's been up to since lockdown um how have you been since lockdown um to start off it was really hard uh you know you know as a deaf person kind of used to being isolated the lockdown had resonance exactly the same a lot of hearing people it was the first time in their lives but as a deaf person i've experienced anyway so and it was, you know, not a huge amount of difference, I suppose. Um, so I just get on with it. Um, I still see my daughter. I'm still chatting with people on Zoom with all my deaf friends. I'm just chatting away in sign language. Um, I also work with ITV. I'm an in-vision interpreter. Um, but under, I've been furloughed now. So I can't go up to the ITV studios to do that. So that's one impact it's had on me. But every Monday, I'm a, a key worker. I'm supposed to see some clients and check they're okay. Um, and obviously, no, I can't do that. So that's sad. So, you know, what happens next? I don't know. You know, it's just impossible to, 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 to tell. But I, hope, I hope it does resolve itself quickly. I really do. Yeah. Yeah, I was just speaking to Dave, who's kindly interpreting for me today. Um, we were talking about Zoom meetings and how everybody's become an expert. And you were saying how Zoom meetings are kind of full now. And there's a hundred little boxes and everyone's trying to vie for attention. Oh, yeah. I mean, everybody, we're having games, we're having quiz nights. We're having a pantomimes, we're having theatre shows, we're having, you know, there'll be 25 on one page and you have to scroll three pages across and then you have to scroll back again, try and find out who's talking. You might be talking to somebody and somebody waving like a mad thing and banging the, the camera to try and get your attention, you know. You can't yeah. shout, it's impossible. You wave and then you've been waving till you're sweating. Oh, 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 oh sorry, I didn't see you there. <laughs> But it is nice to see the deaf community really engaging and every week there's something going and that's really nice. We are we are sticking together and that's fab. That's great. That sounds like um you're being really creative. I wish the hearing community were as creative. We are having like quizzes and things, but I think we could go further. So my next question is going back a little bit, tell us about your creative history and how you got into acting. Oh, when I was young, um, I remember my mum, um, she worked in 
in the Ritz video hire shop, you know, before Blockbuster, the old Ritz video hire shop. And she used to work there. So every week, I mean, at the weekends, we'd get five VHS to watch. And I'd just watch them the whole avidly through the weekend. Absolutely brilliant to the screen. There was no subtitles there, but I was looking at the facial expressions, I was looking at their body language and trying to pick up the plot. Eventually, as uh, the tubs they became subtitles, I realized that my storyline was different to their storyline. So you know, that's a bit of a shock. But then I saw Charlie Chaplin, the old silent, silent movies, and he was amazing because he never used his voice. It's all done through action. I thought, oh, I must be the same as me. That's brilliant. So I thought was fascinated to sort of copy all of his films, his movements. And I used to copy his movements back at school. And people said, that's brilliant. You should become an actor, Adam. Anyway, I kind of dropped it. And I remember asking one of the teachers, and they were saying, it's impossible. You can't be an actor. So feeling a bit gutted, really, and left at that point. But eventually, I was at Hull College. I did a media course there. And just chatting away, and teacher said, "You know, you can do this. That you are creative. You can do YouTube. You can, you can, you can." So I started doing a few YouTubes and filming, and started doing that. I mean, technology was a lifesaver. Uh, people started to recognise me, and I, you know, people saying, "Well, John, can you join in this bit of film?" And the first film was called Vanishing on website. And that was part of the BSL zone. And my first acting role was that. So the, the BSL zone. And that was it. Absolutely, absolutely absorbed from that point onwards. But it, it, the advent of technology that allowed me to achieve that. Yeah, it's true. Technology has been a lifesaver for a lot of um, communities that have not, not traditionally been able to get into the arts easily. Um, you mentioned um, BSL Zone, but which job or collaboration have you worked on that you enjoyed the most and why? The BSL Zone website. I mean, I've worked for a series of those. I think the one called Small World, that was my favourite. It was amazing. There were five deaf actors involved, a variety of characters, but everybody had different ways of producing their okay. sign language. One of them, profoundly deaf, really strong BSL all his life. Another person who just was really had um, sort of limited sign SSE because they have more of a hearing background. Somebody who's involved in international, an international person who was copying a bit of uh, British sign language, Italian sign language, I'm in the mixture of theirs. There's somebody who's brought up deaf all their life, but been brought up in the hearing world, and they dropped into this. I had to learn to sign for the program, and there's loads of mistakes, which is just just funny part of the learning process. And there was somebody who was proper grassroots, born and bred in the community. Oh, fantastic! But really, you no, know, a clever, clever person, really good. So the five of us in one room meant that <laughs> wow all the different modes and means and accents and dialects and ways, which really challenged the assumption that all deaf people are the same um and that series one was just fabulous i loved that piece of collaborative work it was amazing and it used to be like everybody knew this everybody knew that do you know about this do you know about that and it just grew because every okay. it's such a small world the deaf community is you know the whole idea of small world was everybody know each other and what's going on so that was it yeah um is that available to see online anywhere yeah 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 it's available still online on the bsl zone website so look it up small world what's the biggest challenge you've faced in the industry <laughs> Uh, I suppose the first time, the very first film, I did that after that, it was a fantastic, I want to do some more. So I joined, thought, so if I joined a hearing theatre company, I contacted and introduced who I was, you know, I'm deaf, I use sign language, and let them all know that here, you know, I was a willing actor and got nothing back. Absolutely nothing back. And I thought to myself, that, you know, the real world was that 
deaf uh, actors were a marginalized community and the, the view was still out there in, in the industry that you know deaf people can't so you get in a company and you know you try and think alternative way around and you think so how can we communicate oh, without interpreters and the first challenge to overcome is getting in the second challenge is without interpreters how to communicate with each other but you soon get over that but I remember back at university, uh, the course, uh, they asked me, they were looking for a deaf actor. I thought, you know, I can join that university, I'm fine. But we want you to come in, do that hand move thing. What? Hand move? What are you talking about? This is a language, sign language. So kind of that little patronising attitude is out there, you know, 21st century, but people still don't get it. But now, you know, it's, it's a growing industry. It, it, now where we are now, over the years, I think we're, we're in a very good place, really. A lot of deaf actors involved in theatres, films, uh, and I'm really delighted where, you know, the, the place where we are at the moment. That brings me nicely to my next question, actually. Um, why is it important to have deaf representation in, in deaf acting roles or in deaf roles? You know, if you bring in a deaf person, they have that uh, innate knowledge, they have their deaf identity, they know how deaf culture, have that deaf character built up, they've been born and bred into the language and the culture. You know, they, they've got that experience of how to fit in a hearing world with not understanding and all the barriers. And you know, that's the reality. So, you know, you bring that, that, that into a deaf character and immediately you're, you're, you're glued in, you're cued in. But if you brought in a hearing actor who didn't know anything of the, the culture, the background, the deaf awareness, the language, and you know, the whole thing would collapse. It looks fake, it looks false. So deaf people who are watching would go, who's that? That's not real. They're never deaf. They don't look it. I suppose it'd be like a white actor, I guess, wanting to become a black character. And you know, you, you, it just wouldn't be right. It would be, you know, it's just wrong, full stop. It's culturally and everything and linguistically wrong. So, from the from 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 the deaf community's point of view, I mean, it does happen. It does happen, uh, but it's a bit. I can remember the film Hush. Yes, yes. Um, that had a hearing actor uh, being a, playing a deaf character. And the language, the, the language they're producing, you know, the, the style of the language is awful. I, saw myself, I researched why, but it was her husband was directing. So, you know, well, it, you know, it was, it was preordained, really. So there is that, that around, and it's a shame. Yeah, that's the reason I ask, really, because, I mean, I, I know the answer, but I think others need to hear, um, particularly for when you mentioned um, other cultures playing black characters, we no longer blacken our face um, because it's it, because we all know it's wrong. So why so why is it okay for others to you know fake um, hearing impairment or visual impairment? So I completely get that. Yeah, I mean it's a great example. You know all the people who are acting as disabled people. You know, and they get the award or the Oscar, and you know, it, it happens. You know, they, they'd say that it's out there, but it's always able to um, actors who get the, the parts. So, we met when we did Up and Under, and that was the first time I'd seen VV. Um, and I was so inspired by all you actors on that show. So, for, for those people who don't know, what is visual vernacular? And why is it used alongside BSL? Okay, so sign language itself um, has its structure, its grammar, uh, its syntax, its vocabulary, and that's the language. And it's our communication language, same as any other language. We talk about visual vernacular, VV. It, you take the, 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 um, the language element out of it, and you've got movement, facial expression, you're including mime. You're using additional shapes. For instance, you become the car. 
you right. know, have to, you know, if you sort of talk about a car, you could, your eyes would be the headlamps, your, your mouth would be the engine, the wheels would be there like that. So that isn't sign language, but it's, it's using the elements of sign language to be more visually descriptive. So it's almost like a cinema-like series of clips. And, you know, so it's, it's purely visual art form. And it set up um, a while back. First of all, it was, came across from America. One person named Brendan, again, anyway, but BB. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was somebody who joined in Europe who saw this idea and brought it back into Europe where it really spread out. Mm -hmm. And maybe only 10 years back, it probably mm -hmm. came across into the UK. And it's massively popular because it tells stories. And you tell these gorgeous, beautiful stories. Um, how do you think the industry could change to increase access for all? I know it's a bit difficult now with lockdown, but once we're out of lockdown, there do need to be changes made. And how do you think we could implement changes? In access, well, yeah. really, the theater, it starts from the theatre itself, so that hearing and deaf actors can just mix as well as the audience. So it's just absolutely equal platform. So historically, you'd have the hearing actors on the stage and interpreter would be stuck next to the senior march. So deaf people have to look across to the, uh, to the um, interpreter on the corner of the stage to understand all the dialogue. And it was horrible, it didn't work. And sometimes you see subtitles, the stage text. And again, it's either at the bottom or at the top of the stage. And again, you're still missing out on the experience. More recently, the show in Leeds, Oliver Twist, uh, was put on. And that was amazing. It was beautiful. Because what happened was the deaf people, the main characters, had a deaf main character. Uh, they were using sign language. Had Fagin, who was deaf. Uh, Oliver and Artful Dodger were deaf. It was fantastic. So it was, and the, the hearing characters were there, but also they were using gesture and they were using the sign. So anybody who came to watch the show had full access. But they could see some deaf actors. It wasn't labelled disabled theatre. It was just the story of Oliver Twist told in beautiful, beautiful, uh, integrated way. Unfortunately, lockdown cut it short after its first two week run at Leeds, and we're hoping it will come back again at some point. But yeah, having it integrated on stage is the way to do it. And but the deaf actors are really delighted because the the reviews were absolutely amazing. Um, you know, it might be the first time actually said the actors, the characters. Or just that's it. In other words, they didn't normally they'd say something like, Oh, so and so, the deaf actor using sign language, and they'd go on and on and on. But these reviews just said, Oh, it must be that black actor was really, really good. But now these reviews just say, Oh, um, Brooklyn Melvin playing Oliver Twist, fantastic. Um, and Carol Parker playing Fagin, fantastic. There was no mention of any other characteristics apart from their skills as a, as a professional actor. It looks like we are progressing in the right way. And I know um, our friend Stephen was in that, right? Was Nadim in that as well? But I know Stephen was in that. Yes, yeah, Stephen and Nadim were there. Yeah. And you know, I was working with them as well, supporting them. And, you know, I'm just watching them doing their acting. And I want to try and give them advice. I was, I was, I was working as a, a creative on the, in the background, was able to support them. Um, my role there was I was assistant Hang on, what was I? Assistant Creative uh, Director, which meant I was able to give some overviews about where they could just polish up some of the movement, some of the blocking, to make sure it's accessible from a visual point of view and supporting the director, Amy. And um, we had uh, BSL, two BSL consultants came in to make sure that the translations had been accurately done. Um, and, you know, we had to make sure that the hearing actors were understanding and could use language that matched uh, the translations as well. It was fascinating. It was brilliant. I really enjoyed it.
that's so cool that um, theatres are now kind of taking on board that we need creatives from your community to be able to advise properly rather than ju us just thinking, you know, hearing the hearing community thinking that we know how everything should be. Which brings me on to my last question. What job or character or role do you most want to play or what play do you want to do? Do you want to become a director? What do you want to do next? Just the one. Um, little Shop of Horrors. I'd love to do that. Get my hands on that. I want to be the, the main character in that. You know, Seymour. Glasses, little Bob. Yeah, Seymour, Seymour and be him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it'd be fantastic. I'd love to do that. I've wanted to do that for such a long time. Oh, come on, somebody give me a job. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd like to do some directing as well. And I'm just starting to emerge as a director. I don't know what play I'd do. If it could be absolutely anything, I could. I mean, for instance, Charles Dickens or a bit of Shakespeare. Um, you know, I'd love to be able to adapt something like that into full sign language, but integrated again with hearing acts and deaf actors. But you know, this whole idea of get 100% accessible theatre. Not, I mean, what I don't like is having a deaf actor there and a hearing actor there, and, what, and then the deaf actor being just a translator of the hearing actor's role. I feel that's not right. I want it to be a dialogue, you know, just a natural dialogue between, between the actors on the stage. So the, the audience will just enjoy the movement rather than having to watch a deaf actor translate what the hearing actor has just said. You know, it should be, I'd love to be able to just achieve some really great integrated theatre like that. Um, and I'd love to get more deaf actors, you know, encourage more deaf actors, you know, from deaf who BME, deaf LGBT, deaf different religions, mental health. I mean, there's, there's a raft of additional things all in what I'd love to try and bring that all into one play as well, all in one setting. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Um, that's kind of one of the reasons I started this show because I just um, want underrepresented communities and artists to know that there there is a platform um, and just to encourage people to be a bit more creative, you know, get make your own videos, put stuff on YouTube. Um, you never know where it'll lead, that kind of thing. Um, so that's the end of my questions. Thank you so much for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Adam. And thank you, Dave, for helping us. I really, really appreciate it. It's a very funny thing. When I was playing at Loughborough, I never got nervous. I never had a thought about the game, but oh, tonight I'm like a bag of nerves. I've been to the toilet, back to bed. I'm going to the toilet again in a minute. I'm sweating. Sweats dripping down my brow. Even my palms are wet. I'll have to hope that I can, well, drift off to sleep. And there I am, playing at Wembley in the Challenge Cup final. Playing for Fulham against the mighty Featherstone. There's hundreds and hundreds of bloated red faces looking down on me. I'm on the wing and hundreds of yards away from the rest of the team. Featherstone look massive. I gaze up and catch flashes of the kneecaps. Oh, they run through to score. I glimpse sight of the airs on the palms of their hands. We're losing. We need a try. There's, there's five minutes to play. There's an incident off the ball. Get off me, you fat pig. I see a gap, big as an ocean, opening up in front of me. Pass the ball, pass the ball. And then it comes. Out of a blur, the ball. God, I'm nervous. I see it coming towards me. Don't take my eye off it. I 
catch it. And I run. But I don't move. I look up, and the whole of Featherstone are coming towards me. Men. Women. Children. Miners. Shop assistants, garage owners, all on the field after me. So I run, but the faster I run, the slower I go. I look around for someone to pass to. But they're all having lunch. Sat down having lunch in the middle of Wembley Stadium. Go on, Phil, they say. Go on, run, mate, run! And I'm on the underground going down Piccadilly Station. Running. And they're all running after me. Then a policeman stops me. And I try to explain, but he wants my name and where I live. I hit him and I run. It's like running in a dream, jumping over buildings and landing at different places. Wherever I land, they're still there, coming round the corner. I run up an alleyway. I'm cornered. I look around at them. Trapped. So, I run towards them. I just close my eyes and run. That is Adam Bassett, one of the most creative actors I've ever worked with. Um, you can tip him. You can buy him a coffee if you want. Um, all donations can go to our PayPal, which is Fort Culture WY. Um, and all the donations that we get get split between the creatives that week. Um, if you can't donate or buy him a coffee, follow him, follow his socials. You can find him, him on Twitter at, at Adam Bassett Hull. Um, I've got loads of ideas for Shakespeare and Little Shop of Horrors. So if anybody wants to give us some money, um, yeah, we can get into that. I really, really want to play um, one of the characters in Little Shop of Horrors too. I think he'd make a wonderful Seymour. Um, um, yeah, lovely to mention Amy um, and Leeds Playhouse. And hi, Stephen. Thanks for watching. Um, so, yeah, so that's Adam. And that is visual vernacular. Isn't it such a beautiful physical language? When we did Up and Under, um, it's something I learned at drama school as well, but it, it, it kind of hit home more when we did Up and Under. Um, I learned how to use my body more. Um, it's such an expressive kind of art form. Um, and you know many actors, or maybe you don't know, but a lot of actors know that most of us only act from here. Um, and we forget about the rest of our body. Um, I learned a lot on that show. So thank you so much, Jen and Pickles and everybody over at Fingersmiths. Okay. Now we have Movie Madness with Hedda. So we've got a couple of things that he's been watching and a couple of things that I've been watching. Um, 